it's, it's a pleasure to be here, and um, thank you very much, Ike and Caitlin and Elizabeth, for all your um, arrangements. Um, I, um, I'm going to, uh, going through the exhibition, uh, um, it's a great pleasure for me, uh, and, and participating in the catalog as well. So, so often when issues of um, workshop come up, uh, art historically, it uh, becomes a, a, a kind of marketplace or a sociological topic, or it becomes a, a topic about value and judgment, a connoisseurship type topic. Um, but um, as I go through the exhibition and in some of the discussion uh, that Anne prompted, uh, it's, uh, it's a, a kind of psychological topic. And, and I go through the exhibition, I, I feel these, these ghostly presences um, uh, calling out uh, to us. And uh, we'll, we'll do a little bit more of that today uh, in the next hour, is evoke some of those ghosts. I, I did say to, to, to Ike, now this is the, the blame Ike part, so I, I did say um, that um, I asked if it was okay to talk about Delacroix, but also to talk about some other things. And she said, okay. I don't think she was paying attention when I asked her. Um, uh, and, and so we, we, we're going to get to Delacroix and to, to dip into uh, one of the topics that I, I talk about at greater length in, in the essay um, in, in the catalog. But I'm going to start um, uh, around Delacroix and um, surface some, uh, some, some related topics. So what, um, what Harold Bloom uh, would nicely term the scene of instruction, um, modeled on the Freudian primal scene that I won't explain to you because you know about it. Um, what Harold Bloom would nicely term the scene of instruction was in the 19th century profoundly transformed. The master seeds to the teacher the apprentice cedes to the pupil. What is more, the teacher-student exchange, as we call it, would seem newly troubled and disenchanted, forcing each partner in that exchange to recalculate the character of their bond. Frequently mythologized, but not that often interrogated, the relationship between teacher and student emerged in the modern age as newly charged urgently contested and deeply effective terrain. Of course, mostly teacher-student relationships did not go bad, but some did. Um, and as a group, those negative examples allow for an inquiry that we might broadly term pathological. In my remarks this afternoon, I'm going to explore the normal through the abnormal, the pattern through its deviations. And in the first case, I consider a teacher who worshiped false gods and a painter filled with false ambition. Second, I consider the ideas of an art teacher determined to avoid nurturing such calamities in his own pupils. And then finally, when I turn to Delacroix, um, we'll see an illuminating example, illuminating window onto this now fraught and conflicted bond of the teacher-student relationship. If I have time, I'll close with the most notorious teacher-student catastrophe of, the mo of modern art history, key elements of which still elude us. Imitation is suicide, as Ralph Waldo Emerson put it in one of his most famous essays. For Emerson, the warning was a metaphor, but in Romantic France, art and biography could seem wholly intertwined. Make no mistake, claimed the critic Arago, what killed Gros was not hate, uh, which he had grown used to braving. What killed him was sarcasm, ingratitude. Now, Arago was referring to the suicide in June 1835 of the Napoleonic battle painter Antoine Jean Gros, who at age 64 drowned himself in four feet of water, drowned himself in four feet of water, following the calamitous reception of his Hercules and Diomedes at that year's salon, which you see on, on your, uh, your left. The painting's overt display of muscular force, its garish color, the fact that Hercules mysteriously does not look at his victim, all this and more left critics mystified. The public gathered around the picture as before a great rune painted by a ghost. Another critic spoke of wanting, out of pity, to guide this blind old man so that he might avoid this ditch into, it, into which he had the weakness to fall. Alas, cried still another critic, this was Gros Waterloo. Nothing else, as Théophile Torre put it, than the burial of the academic school. 
Well, did critics kill Gro? That is the message of Gro launching himself into eternity, painted shortly, <laughs> painted shortly after his death by an angry disciple. In this idealizing conception, Gro dies for his art, the figure of posterity in the shape of his palette calling him forward as a strange female figure clutching snakes. The snakes are art critics, of course, hounds him, hounds him to the precipice. Now, in the decades ahead, new details of uh, Gros' last, year, last years complicated this emphasis on exogenous factors, ingratitude, lack of commissions, the wrath of art critics, and more. Instead, observers seized on more psychological factors, and more particularly, a deviant and destructive recasting of the teacher-student bond. Gros, argued Sylvestre, for example, was derailed from his natural tendencies by his obsequious um, respect for the principles of David, his teacher, Jacques-Louis David. Ernest Messonnier spoke of Gros as, quote, turning his back to sacrifice to false gods in whom he did not believe. He swore by David, noted his student Charlet, uh, gross student Charlet, and by his counsel and corrections repeated incessantly, it's not me who speaks, it's David and David and always David. Well, what killed Gro, it would seem, was not ingratitude, it was his own bad faith, Gro committing himself to a doctrine that violated his talents and in which he did not truly believe. Now, crucial to this mid-19th century narrative of David's malevolent influence were letters sent, by Gro, sent to Gro by David from Brussels following David's exile. Quote, are you still planning to make a history painting, writes David to Gro in 1820? I think so. Your love of art is too great to persist in futile subjects, to subjects of circumstance, that is to say contemporary subjects. Posterity, my friend, is more severe. It will ask Gro for great history paintings." Unquote. Or again, David wrote, "'Time marches on and we grow older, and yet you still have not made a real history painting. Quick, my good friend, thumb your Plutarch." End quote. <laughs> this, this correspondence left critics shocked. Always the same advice, noted the critic Cheneau in 1860, and always in the same terms. Now, all this nourished a vision of David as a tyrant in a pedagogical key. Cheneau, for example, is uncompromising. Quote, we think, we know, we cannot doubt who to hold responsible for the loss of Gros. David's despotism would never be challenged. It was not criticism, no matter how injurious that killed Gros. It was, rather, the artist who counseled him to return to history painting and who, in effect, signed Gros' death sentence. End quote. Now Delacroix, for his part, was also puzzled by Gros' emasculating fidelity late in life to his former master. But where Cheneau blames David, Delacroix makes what we call a psychological turn, citing Gros' own desire to obey. Quote, the attachment he had for his master was united with boundless admiration for his work. It was almost as if he wished his own students to forget how different his own manner was from that of David, end quote. David's advice to grow to grow to thumb his Plutarch left Delacroix incredulous, and this was given to a 50-year-old man. <laughs> Alas, as Delacroix notes, Gro submitted. Now, assessments of Gro's suicide were often colored by the memory of another tragedy, one no less relevant to the emergence of a liberal therapeutic outlook on art education. I refer to the suicide of one of the legendary figures of romantic art, Leopold Robert, a Swiss painter working in Italy and widely admired for his mournful representations of Italian peasants, bandits, and similar subjects. Robert was afflicted by doubts, and in March 1835, the 39-year-old painter slit his throat with his palette knife in his Venice studio. A year... Um, a year later, Parisians rushed to review Robert's Departure of the Fisherman, completed by the artist shortly before his death, and now in, the, in Neuchâtel. Although the subject of Robert's picture was in no way autobiographical, critics claimed to discover in the picture's mournful figures a veiled image of the doomed artist. Quote, Do you see that old woman, wrinkled and pale, sitting on a stone and crushed with, crushed with sorrow? That's 
Um, do you know who it could be? Look, it's the head, it's the face, it's the eyes, it's the thought even more. It's the sorrow, the sorrow of Leopold Robert. The suicidal Robert, we are told, compulsively traced his sorrow on the countenances of his mournful fishermen, his last painting seeming to betray the unwitting trace of his self-destructive pathology. The news of Robert's death unleashed a torrent of commentary regarding the melancholy disposition of artists, the injurious effects of art criticism, and rumors, too, of an unrequited love for a woman of noble birth. There are reasons for Robert's suicide that have nothing to do with any of these reasons, but I, uh, I won't discuss that at the present time. Gros, by the way, um, did remark about on Robert's suicide, which uh, uh, he, he noted at a dinner that this was a terrible thing, an artist should never commit suicide. And then two months later, he, he would. Uh, uh, Heinrich Heine, who we've heard of uh, already today, heard from already today, writing in the 1840s, would have none of these reasons. Uh, uh, disappointment at love and melancholy and so on and so forth. Uh, Heine, uh, rather, made the case for a kind of artistic suicide rooted in the disparity between Robert's abilities and ambitions. Quote, what pushed Robert to take his life what it, it was what was perhaps the most horrible of all sufferings, that which occurs when the artist discovers the disproportion that exists between his desire to create and his forces of execution. The consciousness of lack, this consciousness of lack of power is already almost death, and the hand does no more than put an end to the agony. Robert, Heine continues, possessed a certain sentiment of grandeur and genius, and yet his talent was restricted to a narrow domain. The true reason for his death was the bitter disappointment of the genre painter aspiring in vain to the joyousness of making grand history painting." End quote. Well, between Robert slitting his throat because he was only a genre painter, a painter of everyday subjects, and the disabling disciples' fidelity that took Gros to the tomb, the vocational crisis of romantic artists set the stage for a proud, profound reform of artistic education. That reform proposed to stamp out such disabling pathologies precisely by rethinking the nature and operation of the teaching studio where such pathologies were understood to nourish and take root. Now, teachers enjoy no greater, uh, part two, teachers enjoy no greater certification than the success of their students. The record of one Paris art teacher Horace Lecoq de Bois-Baudron, unfortunately named, um, but you'll just have to get used to it, uh, was in this regard impressive. Henri Fontaine Latour, Alphonse Le Gros, Léon Lermite, Jean-François Cazin, Oscar Rotti, Auguste Rodin, all counted themselves among his pupils. Quote, most of what Lecoq taught me, Rodin would recall, remains with me still. Now, Lecoq's ideas were forged in the romantic socialist climate of the 1840s. All students, Lecoq maintained, should strive to develop their own unique manner. Quote, art is essentially individual. It is individuality which makes the artist. Now, this attitude was hardly unusual in these years, but its corollary was, quote, it, uh, it fell to education to cultivate and protect this individuality. Here's Lecoq. It is the teacher's job to keep the artist's individual feeling pure and unspoiled." End quote. Fast forward to Lecoq's curriculum. He divided the training of art in five stages. Students began by copying straight and curved lines. That is to say, straight and, copying straight and curved lines from so-called modèles de dessin or engraved figures uh, that were used in, in studios uh, to learn how to make art. Next, they copied geometric figures. Then came the rudiments of relief. Each exercise had to be repeated from memory. In stage three, students moved from copying uh, engraved casts, uh, engraved uh, images as well as casts, to copying uh, casts of body parts, typically from the antique. In the fourth stage, they drew after the live model, at which point they finally studied painting, composition, and perspective. Only then, did they actually sketch out of doors, producing drawings both on sight and from memory. Now, the originality of Lecoq's curriculum lay, lay, lay not in its content, not in the co these copying after engraved models, but rather in its performance. Each copy after an engraved model had to be executed perfectly, 
from the model and from memory before the student was allowed to move to the next more advanced stage. Lecoq enforced this policy with ferocious discipline. Students must acquire the primary faculties, faculties of correctness and precision. Like tools, these faculties have to be sharpened before work. This graduated sequence, as we can call it, strictly enforced, lay at the heart of his method, quote, the one fundamental and absolute principle that dictated the selection of copies and their order. Why so strict? The teacher, Lecoq exclaimed, explained, was simply nature's messenger. Charged with the education of men, Lecoq cited the example of birds. Quote, young birds begin by exercising their wings under the direction of their parents, attempting at first only very gentle movements proportioned to their growing strength. Gradually, those movements become more vigorous and complex, and it is only after they first practice on the edge of the nest that they finally launch themselves into space. Birds, Lecoq tell us, did not attempt to fly until they knew how. <laughs> Birds that leapt from the, uh, from the nest before they knew how to fly fall to their deaths. The graduated sequence, then, was nature's example in education, and so it was with the child. Consider the pupil's very first lesson, a line between points A and B. If, you, if, you, if, if Ike is giving a prize to the most boring slide today, <laughs> I, I hope this one, surely this one will be a strong candidate. <laughs> All right. First, um, students defined points A and B based on a copy placed next to them. After linking the points with dots, the students then united those dots with a line, which is what we had before. This exercise, Lecoq warns, is more demanding than might first appear. Quote, simple as this exercise is, it will almost invariably be found difficult. Forced to repeat the exercise again and again, the pupil will tire and beg to re represent something else, Lecoq tells us. <laughs> but Lecoq insists, the teacher must stand firm. <laughs> Why? Let me read. Children, ever eager for a change, readily clamor for new copies. Certain teachers believe that it increases their interest and enthusiasm if they give in to their whims. But this is a serious and lamentable mistake. Recoiling from the slightest difficulty, the student never really masters any of his tasks and will always remain in this original state of ignorance. The more often the copies are changed, the more complicated and difficult they become until at last they are too great to conquer and the pupil, recognizing his inability to overcome them, relapses into disgust and incurable discouragement. Lecoq traces for us a pedagogical scenario for artistic dissolution. Dissolution. Asked to make a line uniting points A and B, the pupil will soon give up and beg to move on. It may seem harmless for the teacher to give in, but acceding to the child's requests launched a new and dangerous dynamic, a nascent discrepancy between ability and desire. Failing truly to master any task, the child relapses into disgust and discouragement. And so it was all the way up the line, each exercise offering for Lecoq a comparable risk of disappointment and disillusion. To set students' tasks, quote, beyond their powers and their understand them, merely plunge them into the greatest distress, end quote. Now, the philosophical basis of Lecoq's outlook derives from Jean-Jacques Rousseau's Émile, published in 1762 and the founding text of modern education. As he plotted his imaginary pupil's education, Rousseau had proposed to regulate the growth of Emile's imagination. That faculty, he explained, had a dangerous tendency to outstrip a child's powers of action, outstrip his abilities, and outstrip his needs. Fueled by the reading of too many books, unregulated imagination intensified the disparity between ability and desire. Our unhappiness consists, Rousseau famously wrote, in the disproportion between our desires and our faculties. Conversely, an individual whose faculties equaled his desires would be an absolutely happy being. 
Lecoq, we might now say, envisioned his teaching studio as obeying nature's laws. His curriculum was divine, designed to avert the catastrophic divorce of ability and desire, thanks to a graduated curriculum that calibrated each, that is to say, calibrated ability and desire in a perfect identity. Now, Lecoq's concern for the mental health of his students might well seem salutary. What teacher wants to drive their students crazy? And yet, Lecoq's concerns on this score speak to a profound expansion of the teacher's mandate, which now colonized the intimate domain of human feeling. In his mind, Lecoq was just nature's messenger. But in practice, this spawned a curriculum as artificial as innumerable utopian edifices built in nature's name. It fell to the teacher to recreate in the laboratory of the studio the conditions that in a state of nature allowed uh, um, uh, oh, took, uh, took play, the, it fell to the teacher, I'll just start over, excuse me. It fell to the teacher in the laboratory of the studio to replicate uh, the conditions of natural law. It fell to the teacher to replicate a process that in a true state of nature needed no control at all. And control, let us add, is the operative term. It is the teacher who decides what, when, and how the student should imitate. This may be education for freedom, but it is not education by means of freedom, a phrase of, of Stachowinski. Of all the controls Lecoq struggled to impose, none mattered more than control over tradition, including um, control over the authority of the instructor. The idea that an instructor must limit hers or her influence over their students has in the modern May age become essentially axiomatic. Indeed, for some, it constitutes the essence of good teaching. Lecoq, for his part, offers a startlingly rigorous example of this posture. Step by step, he sought to purify the teaching studio of any authority beyond the authority of nature. For example, he discouraged students from visiting museums, at least until they were artistically mature. He also complained about the traditionally collaborative character of the studio, students of different levels assisting each other as they learn their craft. Should a teacher notice the least tendency in a pupil to imitate the works of his more advanced peers, the teacher must check him at once in this evil course. Now, most of all, Lecoq sought to control the disabling effects of his own authority. For example, he refused to draw over a student's work, preferring instead only to point, so as not to trigger the student's desire to copy him. As for Lecoq's own work, he was no less strict. His follower, Félix Régamé, recalled that Lecoq forbade students from seeing his work quote, not wishing to expose them to the temptation of imitating his manner, end quote. So strict was Lecoq on this score that Régamé never saw one of Lecoq's paintings until after the latter's death. <laughs> now, Régamé took Lecoq's policy as excessive, but for Lecoq, it was the logical consequence of his emancipatory pedagogy. So fearful was he <laughs> there are none. There are none. That's, I, there, there, there are actually none. Okay? Uh, it, 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 I can't actually spin out the rest of the curriculum, but Lecoq actually quits painting uh, so as not to, um, uh, not, not to let his own manner uh, affect his judgment. But I'll, so, so fearful was Lecoq of the threat posed by the mimetic character of the teacher's example that he was led to construct an alternative psychically cleansed apprenticeship along naturalist lines. Not only did he evacuate from the teacher-student exchange any argument for the master's priority, by hiding his pictures he forbade their very sight, forbade the sight of his own priority. It was as if his students could not help but imitate their master, which for Lecoq was exactly the point. Merely seeing the master's work implanted in his students the wrong kind of memory, condemning them forever to recall and involuntarily to imitate the paintings of another. Only blindness in his man, 
in his mind. Only the, his students' blindness could protect them, protect them from a traumatic discovery at the primal scene of instruction, a discovery they would automatically internalize and forever reenact. Now, could any of this work? I have spoken of the teacher-student exchange as now colonized by psychology. One of the lessons of that effort is that for all Lecoq's efforts to the contrary, desire never lets go. Uh, never lets go. Take the case of a student's copy after the engraved model. Lecoq advises his teacher to place the student's drawing next to a copy side by side. The copy, the drawing. That way, a student could view the two at once. This method of comparison, Lecoq explains, allowed students to hone their powers of reasoning and observation. Gradually, they internalized the principle of, adjudic of adjudication to the point where they could make the corrections themselves. In art, as in mathematics, Lecoq explains, true progress is um, made when discovering for oneself the principles that one is taught. Sensible indeed. The teacher then wields no power. Teacher and student alike were subject to the same common authority rooted before nature. Lecoq's fantasy of instructorless authority was just that, a fantasy. Authority inscribed as a natural necessity, that is to say, the student himself just comparing back and forth the two works, authority inscribed as a natural necessity was in fact the teacher's authority disguised. And no one knew this better than Lecoq's students, as revealed by the following testimony. Lecoq set me, out, set me down to copy an engraving. When I showed him the result, Confident that I had done it rather well and expecting him to praise me, he took out his penknife right, uh, and with its point and showed me where I had failed really to give the line of the back of the foot and other parts. I set to work again, determined this time to win his approval uh, that he had withheld. Better was his comment, but still not exact enough. And again, the penknife relentlessly pointed out the inaccuracies. Five times I had to make the drawing before he was satisfied. All right. Again and again, Lecoq compares the pupil's drawing to the original, forcing him to start over until he at last gets it right. Should we conclude that the student has internalized the principal's correction? Was nature truly his authority? Consider the pupil's testimony again. Lecoq, he, um, showing Lecoq his drawing, he anticipates praise, but is disappointed. He returns to the second attempt, determined to win the approval that Lecoq had withheld. This drawing was better, but not exact enough. Only after five attempts was the teacher finally satisfied. Lecoq wants his teacher to satisfy nature, but the student only wants to satisfy Lecoq. Getting the exercise right for the student lay not in the calculation of nature, but in the calculation of desire. And why does the student recall this episode in the first place? It's less testimony of the master's instruction than testimony of the experience of being instructed. The difficult the student had in, in, in earning the teacher's praise merely increased its value. There is no shutting down, then, of the student's desire. Without that yearning, without that attraction, no transfer of knowledge, no real teaching can take place. For all of Lecoq's efforts to convince us otherwise, his students found the measure of their success in the only measure that truly mattered, their teacher's satisfaction. To put it psychoanalytically, Lecoq had imagined that by hiding his paintings, by not drawing in front of his students, he might deny the transference its object. But that does not mean he accomplished any such thing. Le père Lecoq, father Lecoq, as his students called him, forged a curriculum that relied on a massive intervention of transferential dynamics into the pedagogical sphere, even as he imagined himself to be shutting those dynamics down. Art teachers, too, let me add, finally, have desires, which brings me to my third case study. In 1857, the 59-year-old Delacroix, this is not by Delacroix, I think you probably know that. Uh, in 1857, uh, the 59-year-old Delacroix was elected to the Institut de France. Success had not come easy. 
It had been Delacroix's seventh attempt at last putting an end to an a draining campaign for institutional recognition that had absorbed him on and off for two decades. In one respect, this belated victory gave Delacroix little pleasure. His chair carried no teaching responsibilities at the École des Beaux-Arts. Nor did it seem likely, given his age and the forces still ranged against him, that such an opportunity would ever be presented to him. It was the prospect of a teaching position Delacroix would maintain that motivated his candidacy, but now that prospect was out of reach. Quote, when they made me an academician, they did not make me a professor at the Ecole, for that is where the danger would lie in the eyes of our learned colleagues. Around a conference table where everyone speaks his opinion informally, um, words do not carry great weight when they are addressed to people whose minds are already made up after a fashion. It is from a teacher's desk, correcting the mistakes of the young, that one can teach something. And unfortunately, teaching posts are filled by, the election of the, by, filled by election by the academicians. This situation detracts vastly from my new post. Delacroix, a teacher? The idea seems surprising. To be sure, he possessed a talent for speculative thought. One need only contrast him to his rival, Ingres, who was incapable of speaking coherently on theoretical matters. <laughs> but if Ingres was no thinker, he knew how to teach, countless pupils passing through his studio. And in one respect, Ingres conducted himself exactly as teachers before him. He presented himself as leading a school. No painting by Ingres more expressed this attitude than his Apotheosis of Homer of 1827, which his pupils regarded as his masterpiece and which spun for Ingres a prestigious genealogy. Signing his name before the figure of Poussin, who stands beneath Raphael, Ingres presents himself as the inheritor of the old masters and as their modern day enforcer. Delacroix, no surprise, scorned the idea of producing disciples. Critics in these years sometimes spoke of artists as being able to faire école, uh, to make a school. The phrase do not, does not translate well, but it describes the way in which a particular artist's reform, practice, or innovation is rendered influential and orthodox, and as it were, academic. The notion left Delacroix contemptuous. Only secondary or mediocre talents, he insisted, were able to faire école. Van Loo, for example, whose manner dominated the 18th century academy, or the sectarian David, who broke with Van Loo only to promote orthodoxies of his own. Like Ingres, Delacroix appealed to the old masters for support. But where Ingres worshipped Raphael, Delacroix identified with Michelangelo, whose example was held to have destroyed his imitators. In 1849, Delacroix portrayed Michelangelo sitting alone in his studio, the instruments of his craft lying unused at his side. Théophile Sylvestre described this image of the old master as a mediated self-portrait of Delacroix himself. Tracing his own features and those of his predecessor, Delacroix embraced the legend of Michelangelo's disillusion. Quote, in this figure of Michelangelo at rest, we recognize Delacroix, tired, beaten, crestfallen. The scarf, the famous scarf of Delacroix, he's placed his own scarf around Michelangelo's neck. Delacroix and Ang, then, stand at pedagogical antipodes. Le grand solitaire versus the rigid schoolmaster. It seems fitting that Delacroix should have no pupils and that Ang should produce them in scores. Delacroix was never able to have students, writes Sylvestre. A savage and bilious genius, he remained proudly solitary amidst a banal generation. Those who sought to follow Delacroix not only failed, but perished in the attempt. Lacking the force to leap giant distances, they threw themselves into the void. No wonder Delacroix left not the slightest successor. Not even, adds Sylvestre, one little Flink. Those of you who are Rembrandt scholars know who Flink is. Um, some art historians have fought back, dismissing the view that Delacroix couldn't teach as a smear campaign led by rivals bent on keeping, me, keep, keeping him out of the Institute. And yet it's not hard to conclude that Sylvester was right. Not one of Delacroix's followers or assistants had a career on the scale of one little flink. All of this to say is that Delacroix's bitterness does not add up. 
His failure to teach was not, as the artist himself seemed to believe, the result of forces ranged against him. But then what was he complaining about? Why protest upon his election to the Institute that he had been denied the prize he most cherished? What the example of Delacroix offers is not an actual teaching career, but something perhaps just as valuable, an imaginary one. Delacroix, let us recall, put his disappointment like this. Quote, it is from the teacher's desk, au pupitre de l'école, correcting the mistakes of the young, that one can teach something, end quote. These remarks bear less on the substance of Delacroix's teaching than on its experience, less on the content of its instruction than on its performance. Delacroix envisions himself standing at the teacher's desk, surrounded by students. He imagines himself at the scene of instruction, overseeing the transfer of knowledge from master to pupil. This was Delacroix's pedagogical desire. Now this desire, I think, was inextricably linked with Delacroix's concerns about posterity, posterity, concerns that overtook him in middle age. I refer mainly to artistic posterity, but from Delacroix's point of view, the distinction was less clear. The death in 1834 of his nephew left him without descendants, Delacroix, Delacroix complaining that had, he had, quote, lost his last living friend in the order of nature. Quote. This creeping sense of genetic isolation doubtless, doubtless colored his desire to enter the classroom. We could also point to his fears about the fragility of modern paintings. Baudelaire recalled that Delacroix fretted over the uncertain durability of his pictures, which could not circulate like printed texts. Delacroix expressed similar fears regarding the technical processes of modern artists, which, as he saw it, had fallen into decline following David's suppression of the academy. The academy. Modern techniques, Delacroix complained, were not on the same level as those of the old masters. Quote, all our paintings will soon perish. But Delacroix was right to be concerned, although, alas, his own search for the secrets of the old masters would often make his paintings still more unstable, and I know we're going to hear more about that. Anxiety over posterity also drove Delacroix's complaints about reproductive printmaking. As Baudelaire reports, this artist keenly regretted that he had not found yet his translator. Here was further reason to envy the old masters who had such skill, skillful engravers available to them. Unquote. Or consider Delacroix's lifelong enthusiasm for mural painting. Easel paintings were prone in Delacroix's mind to dispersal and destruction. But in a mural, Delacroix explained, the artist's imprint was eternal. So thoroughly did such concerns overtake Delacroix that they seemed to drive the pace of his work. Sylvestre reports that Delacroix, as he got older, worked ceaselessly to the point of exhaustion. Quote, the hand of Delacroix cannot rest. He is devoured, despite the skepticism his words betray, by a thirst for immortality. What will they think of me when I am dead, he sometimes asks himself. Delacroix's inexhaustible fecundity, then, was not just a response to the marketplace. Rather, it was abundance tinged by anxiety. Delacroix increasing his pace in a doomed contest against forces of destruction and dispersal. Quote, countless accidents conspire against wood and canvas. Does it not seem that in multiplying their works as much as they can, that they have an increased chance of floating above this ocean of forgetfulness? Delacroix's anxious abundance, his allegiance to mural painting, his fascination for the secrets of the old masters, his efforts to find the right translator, missing from this constellation of concerns was the most powerful instrument of artistic afterlife, namely followers. Although Delacroix dismissed the idea of making a school, his dream of standing at a teacher's desk did not go unanswered. A it was it with his collaborators, his assistants, that he worked out this relationship, this imaginary relationship. Ostensibly, the arrangement was strictly professional. Delacroix regarded his apprentices as social inferiors whose ambitions were not permitted to interfere with the master's interest. But his assistants did not see it that way. Yearning for something more, they conducted themselves less as employees than as disciples, and each, accordingly, fell victim to the disorders that are the disciples' share. Now, perhaps this sorry denouement was not Delacroix's fault. It was his pupils, after all, who chose to act out. It was they who transformed an economic and contractual arrangement into an effective relationship 
destined to unravel, proof positive of the disabling conduct that Delacroix himself had imagined to combat. And yet the pattern of severed attachments suggests that Delacroix was complicitous in this drama. He, no less than his assistants, discovered in the bonds forged between master and pupil something more than professional service. Now, Anne LaRue has already spoken eloquently about the notorious grudge, rightful grudge, apparently, held against Delacroix by Gustave Le Salle-Bolt. For my part, I want to consider another relationship gone bad, the case of Louis de Planet. Planet on your left, and um, one of his pictures on your right. You have Ike's opinion of Planet's manner, um, <laughs> to which I have nothing further to add. Uh, now, today we remember de Planet mainly for his detailed journal of his tutelage under the master, uh, a journal that offers a valuable record of Delacroix's working methods. But de Planet offered Delacroix something beyond technical assistance. And for this, we must turn not to de Planet's recollections, but to those of Delacroix himself. In this case, his account of a meeting with de Planet in February 1847. By now, de Planet has struck out on his own. He returns to Delacroix's studio for a visit. Delacroix, in turn, shows de Planet some recent work. De Planet came at four o'clock. He seemed very taken with my sketch. He would have liked to see it on a large scale. The sincere admiration he evinces gives me great pleasure. He is one of those who reconciles me with myself. May heaven reward him for it. Oh, the poor lad is totally lacking in self-confidence. And that is a pity, for he has fine qualities. Now, the skills of an analyst are not required to recognize that the pupil's dependent state lives on, each visit, return visit renewing the conditions that kept him subservient. Delacroix claimed not to understand. The poor lad is totally lacking in self-confidence. And yet the boost in confidence, when it came, would disastrously misfire. Frustrated by lack of success at the salon, de Planat would later charge his master with failing to promote him. Delacroix, taken aback, disputed the charge and broke with de Planat. Quote, he rightly lost the genuine affection I had for him, end quote. Predictably, the wounded disciple found the quarrel too much to bear. Beating a furious retreat, de Planat reconstituted the bond in recollection and in imagination. Following Delacroix's death, de Plena devoted a ver veritable cult to his memory. If our goal is to discover in de Planet's apprenticeship anything resembling emancipation, Delacroix's remarks offer grim reading. But the relationship between Delacroix and his disciple, I'm suggesting, cut both ways. The teacher profiting from the dependency that the relationship sustained. Consider Delacroix's account again. Delacroix shows de Planet a sketch or a study, which his disciple dutifully compliments. We don't know what sketch for certain, but truly it does not matter. No one today needs de Planet's assurances. Delacroix, however, was gratified. De Planet's sincere admiration, sincere admiration gives me great pleasure. And then Delacroix adds, he is one of those who reconciles me with myself. Excuse the typo. Why should de Planet's approval matter? What did Delacroix mean by feeling reconciled? We might begin to answer those questions by posing another question. Why do teachers teach? Despite a prodigious body of literature on teacher conduct and the teacher-student exchange, the question of what motivates teachers is rarely posed. The answer, when it comes, is typically sanitized. We think of teachers as engaging in a vocation or responding to a call evoking notions of service and devotion to the needs of others. As for what teachers need, their desire, we treat that desire as scandalous. The teacher's desire must invariably be managed or shut down, lest it contaminate the transfer of knowledge or compromise the student's own development. Put in psychoanalytic terms, teachers must control their own counter-transference. It was Anna Freud, Freud's daughter, who made this point in 1930, Quote, teachers must learn to know and control their own conflicts before they begin educational work. Anything else, she warns, and the pupil will merely serve as more or less suitable material on which to inscribe unconscious and unresolved difficulties. Quote. Fair enough. 
Such warnings make good sense from the perspective of students, but for present purposes, the student's point of view is beside the point. The dream of teaching without desire is wholly impractical, for the dream of the teacher is precisely to have students. Having in the students in the visual arts means having influence, and the chief reward of influence is a sense of posterity, which is arguably what Delacroix evokes when, listening to de Planet, he speaks of feeling reconciled. We might put reconciliation like this. The sense of reconciliation Delacroix experienced from de Planet arose from a fantasy of posterity underwriting the teacher's call. We as he matures, Delacroix recalculates the terms of his accomplishment. He may have feared imitators, but he fears even more his own disappearance. Hence the anxious fecundity, the mural painting, the hunt for the secrets of the old masters, the painted replicas, and other measures that to assure his imprint will be internal. But the classic instrument of immortality available to artists lies in the teaching arena, namely pupils. Charging their students with disseminating their manners, artists assure the posterity of their interventions by establishing them as normative. By virtue of their imitations, or simply by their presence, students offer a teacher reassurance, indeed proof, proof that he speaks a language others comprehend, proof that his intervention is not merely singular, proof that he inhabits a universe numbering more than one. Needless to say, such feelings of reconciliation travel in only one direction only. De Planet claims to understand the master. He is very taken by Delacroix's sketch. For his part, Delacroix is confident that his pupil's admiration was sincere. Doubtless, De Planet's admiration was sincere, but his sincerity was simply a function of his dependence. What guarantees the teacher he's being understood is not the quality or considered nature of his student's judgment, but the fact that the student has no judgment. Because the student submits to the master's influence, he validates and certifies the master's intervention. The approval de Planet supplies Delacroix cannot operate outside the dynamics of the teacher-student exchange, and indeed is its product. For all Delacroix's complaints about schools, followers, imitations, and David's seeming pedagogical tyranny, his t critique of the teacher-student bond also left him feeling alone. Faced with his own disappearance, he would rehearse the pedagog pedagogical rituals of another age, searching for effects of posterity he could sense and understand. Now, I don't have time, but where this project goes next is to take up not one, but two of the great bookends of the teacher-student calamity, um, and uh, both, uh, both cases where the uh, psychodynamics of imitation coincide with its erotic dynamics in the studio. The death of Constance Mayer in 1821 in an engraving by uh, a lithograph by uh, Deveria. Uh, she slit her throat in the studio of her, uh, her partner, uh, Prudon, and then more famously, the case of Camille Claudel, interned uh, in an asylum in 1913 and then uh, died in 1943. And the only thing I'll say about this famous case that you all know so well is to evoke uh, Rodin's phrase of his bond with Claudel, which are almost exactly the same terms that Delacroix used to, to evoke his uh, bond with uh, De Planet. Rodin says about Claudel, we work together so much, I consulted about, about her about everything. She is the one who really understands me. And the teacher seeks a kind of understanding so that uh, he doesn't go crazy, that he's not the only person speaking this language he invents. Uh, but the price of that is the crushing of his disciple, which in um, the case of both Claudel and Constance Mayer, obviously, uh, arguably involves a whole extra set of um, pressures around the erotics of the studio. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. OK, so to paraphrase uh, Monsieur Lecoq de Beaubourin, de Beaubourin, I fear that in her encouragement and support, Ike's nomination uh, of me as respondent for Mark has set uh, a task too difficult for me to conquer, 
And unfortunately, in this instance, um, not only will the pupil, i.e. me, uh, recognize uh, my inability uh, to overcome and master this, this task of respondency, um, and thus I will find myself apt, apt to lapse into disgust and incurable boredom. But there's a further penalty here because, unfortunately, so might the audience in this in instance. Um, so I stand here on the edge of the nest, uh, not to mention gross precipitous precipice, and um, albeit, you know, minus any snakes. And um, my own version of Lecoq's emancipatory rhetoric in, this, to this, in terms of this task would be for me with tremendous relief to find, to successfully find a paper left behind by a previous speaker and simply uh, slavishly follow the mimetic imperative to copy and read this paper. Um, however, uh, you know, Lecoq's penknife uh, his instructorless paradigm, not to mention uh, the, the desperate urge for note-taking, uh, directs me to a, uh, a, 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 something I picked out from Ike's essay, so i just like to sort of bring that into play here. Um, when she points out, when she pointed out in her introduction that there is something tragic about Planet's compulsive note-taking, right after a bout of uh, Delacroix's co corrections to his work. For no matter how specific the instructions, Delacroix cannot teach Planet how to paint what he alone uh, can see. And we then discover that Planet tried ceaselessly uh, to pin down the secrets to Delacroix's color, this hapless devotion that Mark spoke so eloquently about, by filling his journals with page after page of exact notes. So there's that like desperation to, um, to, follow, um, to follow the master. And no matter how he tried, uh, he just couldn't get the recipe right. So um, I would also like to, because I don't want to uh, wax too uh, non-lyrical after, <laughs> after Mark Gottlieb, uh, I would also like to thank Mark Gottlieb for um, his uh, introducing me to this important dynamic of uh, teachers in relations teacher and student relationships in the 19th century because it's fair to say that prior to my reading your work, Mark, um, my understanding of this dynamic, I was really somnolent about it. And I would have to say, thinking about this last night, my feelings about students in the history of French 19th century painting in particular, and in the case of Delacroix, as uh, pupils in particular, was on a par with my feelings about Pete Best. Now, um, <laughs> these feelings amounted to a kind of vague sympathy for the ill-fated Best. And so who is Pete Best? Well, this unfortunate surname is affixed, another unfortunate surname, is affixed to the ill-fated founding drummer for the Beatles. Um, <laughs> Best was sacked. I, I, I didn't even have to look at this up in Wikipedia. It's so embarrassing. Best was sacked by the rest of the band because of his mediocre ability to keep time. <laughs> he didn't have the accuracy that would have been second nature to a trained session musician and his apparently spirited playing, not to mention moody good looks, couldn't compensate for uh, his, 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 his inaccuracy and he didn't even strive for compulsive note taking. Um, so in this instance, my, as Mark actually knows, my dubiously vast knowledge of popular culture has proved useful for once because it has furnished an example deficient in everything to do with teachers and students in 19th century France, yet nonetheless able to reflect the exceptionally high stakes, not to mention the high emotions that Mark addressed in his paper and always takes on in his work. Emotions which range from a devastated powerlessness on the one hand to a ruthless impatience on the other, the impatience in this instance of superior talents, whose eyes, even at an age far more tender than the elderly Delacroix, were trained on horizon of promised immortality. Um, so um, 
I think with the um, unexpected arrival of the Beatles into the auditorium this afternoon, I should conclude my, <laughs> my, uh, my commentary on your paper, and I do apologise if you are in the situation now of the rather bemused Delacroix as the hapless Baudelaire stumbles into his studio and uh, waxes kind of, uh, you, know, uh, you know, not exactly eloquent, but uh, offering too much praise in any event. So um, let me, um, I don't know if you can even answer that. <laughs> it's kind of a rush of comments. But so perhaps um, I could open the, uh, the questions up if uh, people have a specific engagement. Have we reached that point of fatigue where caffeine is more important? Than <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll ask a question. Um, so this is for M Mark, obviously. Um, uh, so it's funny when you're tell t telling us about Delacroix and about um, you know how the teacher w wants to uh, see. Uh, his student just uh, become himself and uh, inevitably that destroys, so the best student becomes the worst artist or the, uh, um, uh, or, and also when you just talk about teaching in general, I mean it's, it's great stuff, let me say that r right off the bat, but it's funny, you often sort of tell us the narratives that the 19th century told itself and, um, but Somehow when I hear you talking about the teacher, I hear you talking about something that's not just a 19th century narrative, but something that's, I don't know, still a narrative today, still true. Um, so I'm, I, I think my question is, um, that teacher that Delacroix was, was that just the way Delacroix saw, saw it, or is that a little bit in every teacher? What, what are you saying there? I'm saying I'm looking for a microphone, or should I just? Oh, I, I am mic'd, yes, sorry. Um, I think I, I very uh, deliberately in all these cases um, try and speak of the teacher-student uh, relationship as a, um, an effectively universal psychological syndrome. Um, in the sense that if you are going to make a, a psychological claim uh, about human, uh, um, human interaction, you, um, you're implicitly making a universal claim. We don't have to accept that um, the edible complex is universal. We don't even have to accept that there is such a thing as, a universal, as, as an edible complex. But once you start speaking uh, the language some kind of psycholo psychological language, no matter how much you historicize, as I, I try in the 19th century, uh, I think implicitly um, one is also accepting that there are uh, psychological dynamics that we share um, with uh, individuals in much different, co in cultures that are much different than us in, in other ways, okay? Um, so that's, um, whether we, you agree with that statement or not, that's a, a kind of an enabling premise of, of my investigation to try and call on a uh, relatively contemporary understanding of the teacher-student relationship and to read 19th century evidence um, with that understanding in place. Uh, so I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm answering your question, but um, uh, certainly some of the, the, the work that I have read that has informed the way that I explore uh, the historical situation, some of that work comes out of contemporary or more or modern day readings of how uh, student, students and how the, the teacher-student transferential relationship works. Now one could dismiss all that as just uh, psychoanalytic machinery and, and not relevant to the, to the 19th century, but um, the machinery is quite light in this case. It's not heavy duty psychoanalytic machinery, it's just very simple uh, psychoanalytic concepts. And what I try is, to, is to, to push the historical evidence as far as I can uh, in, uh, to find evidence of, of this, um, um, of, 
of these psych psychological um, processes. And what it does for me is it opens up a, a whole lot of uh, relationships that we sort of know about but haven't interrogated. And that could be um, the, the suicide of Leopold Robert, or it could be these feelings of Delacroix, or it could be Lecoq's totally bizarre curriculum. Uh, but uh, these are, for me, very enabling um, tools that uh, help create, uh, uh, offer a new way to look at these relationships that we know were fraught and difficult. Uh, but that we haven't, um, uh, for which we're still trying to find uh, ways to articulate them. So I'm not sure that's an answer to your question, but. Someone's laughing, but I can't see who. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, Mark, that was a great talk. Thank you very much um, for that. I, I was struck by what you said about Lecoq and how he, as an artist, he wouldn't let his students um, see his own work in case they were influenced by it. And, and I'm interested in the way that some artists who are teachers obviously want their students to look at their work. I mean, I think of Ankh, you know, so many of his students painted, you know, in, in his image and, and create this school, if you like. And then one of the greatest uh, artist teachers of the 19th century, Gustav Moreau, mm. who is such an idiosyncratic artist, and yet he has so many fantastic students who go on to great, great things. None of them look anything like Gustav Moreau. Um, did Morrow also stop his students looking at his work? Um, um, there's a guy in the room who's actually can answer that better than I can. Um, he's, but I, I don't think so. But um. This is very convenient for us. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I haven't worked on Morrow's pedagogy, but certainly the stories that always were repeated was that he did try to um, you know, shield his students from his own practice. And uh, everything that you were saying about uh, Le Coq de Bois Baudrin really resonated in my mind with things that, stories about Moreau um, in, the, in the later 19th century. So I think he certainly bought into this kind of an ideal of emancipatory um, pedagogy, but I think it also came, in Moreau's case, from um, his own personal sense of um, inferiority vis-a-vis -vis the weight of tradition and his own anxieties there and he probably felt I think he was quite conflicted about the the status of his own art um, and and perhaps you know not completely confident that it that it could serve as a good example I mean there's a lot of unresolved um, things and um, in his in his practice I, f I find him to be kind of an interesting failure on many levels um, I may be projecting, but um, since I have the <laughs> si since I have the microphone, can I can I address uh, just make a comment with regard to the the excerpt from the the journal yeah. um, with regard to um, Planet's visit to Delacroix's studio, and you did a really nice job unpacking that. But the one aspect of that quote that you didn't address was his alleged comment that he would have liked to have seen the sketch on you know on a larger scale, as if he was actually recalling to Delacroix the apprentices share in realizing the master's work in terms of taking the sketch and, you know, plotting out the ebauche and sort of perhaps nostalgically recalling their collaborative relationship in the immediate past. I don't, maybe that's, that's a stretch, but. It's possible. Uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, that's certainly possible. It's, it's, it would be hard to know how to um, verify that. I, I read that sentence, it's a little more like when you, um, you go visit your uh, former dissertation advisor and they give you something in manuscript and you feel gratified by the opportunity to read it in draft and you say something like, oh, well, I can't wait to sit till it's published. And um, there's this kind of unwritten, um, uh, unspoken psychological um, bond that is created through this sort of um, disciples' validation of, of their, of their uh, master's uh, uh, aspiration to publication. Let me just on the Lecoq thing, what I, 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 I'll freely grant that, I mean, Lecoq is writing this in the 1870s, teaching from the 1840s to the 1870s, but uh, I certainly read his curriculum in a, in a contemporary sort of way. Um, in, in my defense, Lecoq is not a traditional master. He doesn't have, he's not like Gustave Moreau, he's not like Jerome, he's not like Couture, or any other of the great art teachers of the 19th century. 
but he was an, an amazingly successful teacher in terms of the quality of the students, the quality of the work that his students ultimately did. And what he also was, which is so interesting for us, is he self-identified himself at, by the end of his career, uh, not as an artist, but as a professor, as, as a teacher of art. And he drew an absolute distinction uh, that he talked about at length between the role of the art teacher, which uh, w the role of the master, which belonged to the past, and the role of the art professor that belonged to the future. And he called on art professors of the future to stop making art so as not to compromise their students' <laughs> own development. And then he also complained in passing that, and because I've made this decision, student, uh, I am called in the art world dead fruit a failed artist. And you will see versions of this argument played out in art schools now again and again and again um, in around the dynamics of the teaching artist and the burden of the teaching artist. And there, there's, all Lecoq does is put in sort of very beautiful and radical terms a set of problems that dominate the teaching of art uh, and the relationship between artists and their students and the um, transfer of their manner. It dominates uh, the teaching of art, as far as I've encountered it in, in my anecdotal and haphazard experience uh, into the present day. Okay, we both <laughs> <laughs> well, Thank you, Mark. Um, I, I wanted to talk a bit about uh, or ask you or think about Lecoq again. And um, uh, it was um, very compelling, the notion that he would disappear and, or his work would disappear. But there's also the component of his use of, as you said, he's using engravings or it, the, 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 the model de dessin. The model yeah. are not drawings, right? Or they're no, just, they're, they're engravings. They're yeah. engravings. So he's, again, that, that, uh, that was very helpful for me because I would think when you initially introduced that, I was thinking about these kind of immutable designs, and I was thinking of like the project of Molly Nesbitt with um, this immutable project in terms of con uh, later de uh, the teaching of design in the later 19th century. But here, it, um, the notion of this counter transference that's taking place is not just his own work, but the, the kind of demonstration of the work in the studio, and that there is the distantiation that occurs through the uh, engraving technology. So that's more of a comment. The dismantling of his own authority. You know, mean, yeah. Dismantling. And so you can, you can cease making art if you have the reproductive technology here in place. Uh, so, that, um, so how do you see that? Um, I'm, I'm, I've been also thinking about, again, we were thinking about Delacroix and then his relationship to Rubens, and he, and he makes his trip up north, but he also is kind of checking his memory with kind of engraving technology there. Do you see, uh, um, is there a, um, is, is Rubens a dead teacher for Delacroix? Is there, do you see that, that kind of relationship established? Or does, it, does your model depend upon this kind of intense interpersonal model? You know, it's, a, it's a difficult, I, I, I don't have an answer to your question and I, I, I fear working on Delacroix a lot because he's such a, um, um, he painted so much and um, he's for me a very difficult and inaccessible artist partly because of his uh, thorough and complete embrace of the art of the past in a way that is very hard for us to understand. Uh, given, for example, his call on artists not to imitate the art of the past. Uh, and uh, it's, um, I, have a, I have an account of that, but it, um, I'd have to pull out the machinery and I'm not, I'm not quite sure I, I, I can do it, but I, um, he has an acute sense of uh, his relationship to the art of the past, but it's, um, it's almost as if he, um, expands the canon of art that he imitates uh, in order to, in a sense, neutralize the priority of one or another. And uh, so that his, his embrace of the past is uh, um, 
uproots artists from space and time and, and they, they are consumed by his imitative machinery, his compulsive drawing every single day and tens of thousands that he drawings he produced after the old masters and that sort of thing. So he has his own um, way, as it were, of, of, um, of he's identified his own strategy, but I, I think it's a highly personal one and one of, one of the problems for me with Delacroix is he's so I idiosyncratic in some ways that uh, you, you, w you go into that terrain and it, it's not easy to come out. Um, it's kind of like working on Blake, you just, mm -hmm. you, you um, you have to spend a lifetime sort of studying how it works. So m my, my intervention in Delacroix is really very restricted to his disastrous relationship with his three students. The one we haven't talked about is his favorite student, Andrieux, which um, was not a relationship gone bad except for the charges, um, well I don't know if they were ever substantiated, that Andrieux uh, forged Delacroix uh, uh, drawings after his death, and I, I, maybe Nina knows whether or not those charges stuck or not, but it, it, it's, it'd be wonderful if it was true, okay, because uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, apparently they are, but the major uh, charges that have come up, backed up by research, uh, to my awareness, is that he actually forged the seal, the studio yes. seal, yeah. you, the you know about yes, that? Yes, yes, yeah. because he, he managed Delacroix's mm -hmm. estate. Right, uh, after right. Delacroix died, yeah. um, and a shadow was cast early in the 20th century over that process, and it, it might be that Delacroix's ultimately last student and the one who mastered Delacroix's manner so perfectly, uh, in fact, started producing Delacroix out of the estate, um, which right. is. Yeah, actually, Lee Johnson uh, is in line with this idea. Um, about the seals, the most recent thing I read was in the uh, bulletin of the Musée de la Croix with all the seals actually lined up um, uh, and, and, and the fake ones, of course, identified and researched. So I think that clears it. And obviously, if he forges the seal, it's not only to put it on de la Croix drawings that are you know, in the studio, but also on his own drawings as the Lacroix authentic, yeah. And my goal is not to, to take sides. I mean, what I'm describing is the breakdown in the artisanal relationship, the economic relationship between master and apprentice under the nepotistic contract, as Anne said, you're promoted by the master and you, you might end up, you know, marrying his daughter or going off on your own or something like that, but there are artisanal practices that were in place for thousands of years. But with the, um, you know, in a, in a very broadly speaking, with the transformation of the student-teacher relationship as a psychological and artistic rather than an economic relationship, it becomes the site of all sorts of um, very human problems. And both the teacher, in Delacroix's case, and his students get caught up in its psychodynamics. So it's not about taking sides. In this particular case, where Delacroix had essentially destroyed his, his imitators, or even in the Rodin, Camille Claudel case, it, it's not about taking sides, it's by exploring each side and what the pressures are on the teacher uh, who yearns for the disciple, for the reasons that I tried to suggest, and the disciple who in turn yearns for the kind of validation that comes from the teacher. Uh, Mark, I thought that was just a stunning paper and I thank you for it, as well as your um, essay in the catalog, so thank you. And I realize Todd and I have been thinking side by side for a long time, so it's not a surprise that he, his question had something to do with what I wanted to ask you about. Which it does seem that it's partly, I mean, um, the vividness of the teacher-student relationship you, you so beautifully um, vivified for us. But I also was struck by, you know, what you were describing as um, Delacroix's panic about his, the longevity of his career. And it's the potential relationship to the ways in which he's trying to make painting survive against other reproductive technologies. I mean, it seems, and I know that we often have Stephen Bann in this conversation, but I mean, it does seem that one of the amazing sort of efforts he's making is to churn out all those small pictures that keep being about the touche and the hand mm -hmm. as a kind of repost, right, to 
having engravers, I mean, sometimes students could do reproductions after the fact, for instance, for mass reproduction, but it seems that that is precisely what he doesn't want to imagine having done to reserve, or am I wrong? I mean, do you want to speak to that? Well, I, I, I think he gets upset that he can't find an engraver. Who could uh, capture But it? in the end, he, he does start to work with uh, a whole suite of, of, of printmakers. But the, his anxiety over his disappearance is psychologically driven, not empirically driven. Right. So it, it has count, it, there, he could have painted thousands of more pictures and right. still felt that uh, um, he needed to do more. There, there, was, there was no way of, no, right. once he was in the grip of this fear of disappearance, mm -hmm. there was no way um, of, of stopping it. The irony is that almost all of his convictions, which were historically uh, determined as to what he should do, were, were wrong. Uh, the, the idea that mural painting uh, was more stable than easel painting, historically has turned out to be probably wrong. Mural uh, buildings burn down, murals get trapped in government buildings and no one is ever allowed to look at them. Um, <laughs> they're hard to see and, and easel paintings, in, uh, unless they are consumed and this and that. It, paradoxically, easel paintings have survived. Um, uh, Travel to Santa Barbara, <laughs> and, and 19th century artists, though, uh, under convinced that in part this is the way the old masters worked, uh, felt that only in a mural painting, because it was fixed in one place, could uh, represent uh, immortality. And, and also, most of all, in, in his technical procedures uh, with, with Delacroix, working with color merchants and constantly um, searching for um, uh, lost processes, this paradoxically rendered his, his painting still more unstable, though I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defer to uh, conservators and others who are, are more expertise in that. So he is searching for tools of posterity, and ultimately all of them, right? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm so struck that here's a man who started painting before photography and is contending with photographs of the 1855 mm -hmm. expos, et cetera. I mean, the, the sense of reproduction being something that he has to contend with in some way or another and posit as an alternative to it, Yeah, I have to think about that, that mm -hmm. twist you put on it. I, um, yeah. I th thank you. I have to think about it. So I think because we're running a little bit late, we probably should take an abbreviated coffee break. Um, can we get back here and... 15 minutes, is that possible? Um, thank you. Um, good afternoon, I'm Claire Berry. I'm the Director of Conservation at the Kimball Art Museum. And I want to thank Larry Feinberg and the staff at the Santa Barbara Museum of Art for the wonderful arrangements and for really sponsoring a wonderful exhibition like Delacroix, The Matter of Finish. And I'd especially like to thank Ike. It's, it's really fun to be working with you again on um, the, the latest in your series of really groundbreaking exhibitions. And uh, I want to thank all of the speakers today for a truly riveting day of talks. Um, I'm going to have perhaps in some parts of my talk more images than words um, because it will really be in many ways a looking exercise and I'm also really looking forward to the discussion with Eric Gordon afterwards. Um, so I I'm, I'm, have to admit right up front that Ike played the role of Lecoq in choosing the title, <laughs> the material consequences of some of Delacroix's technical flaws, remedies. Literally, this is the A and the B that she drew for me, and I'm trying to draw the line. I have to admit, getting to remedies is going to be difficult, but we'll try to see what we can come up with. Um, so as we've heard, Delacroix envisioned writing a dictionary of fine arts for instructional use, covering topics such as touch, execution, impasto, and realism. And I thinking about was reminded of this and we had this wonderful discussion just now about teaching and his role as a teacher that he envisioned writing this um, dictionary for instruction. He insisted on the importance of projection, both illusionistic and real, and on the signifying role of the paint layer. Above all, as we know, he challenged the academy, rejecting academic painters 
for their reliance on a slick fracture. He was opposed to David and Angra, who were always advocating contour and flat tone. Instead, Delacroix valued touch as the bearer of meaning, and he made technical in innovations by emphasizing sketch elements in his work. And one of the things I'll try to discuss today is how difficult the challenge, um, the, the, the difficult challenge that we conservators face in preserving that touch as the bearer of meaning in his work. Interestingly, um, in his Dictionary of the Fine Arts, Delacroix never drafted the projected title, article titled Finish. For um, The notion of incompleteness was very important to him. There are several ways that we've learned about his materials and techniques. One important source of information, of course, were his own journals, uh, which he kept uh, from 1822 to 1863, and as we've heard, his student, Louis de Planet, uh, described in detail working with Delacroix in his memories of working on paintings with Monsieur Eugène Delacroix. Etienne Haro, um, Delacroix's friend and the uh, merchant who provided him colors and, and paint materials, uh, was also an important figure in, Delacro in Delacroix's uh, life as an artist, and we have letters from Delacroix to Monsieur Arrault requesting um, an order of colors, which we see here. And I do think that this is a rich topic uh, worthy of a lot more explanation, uh, exploration, um, because as we will hear a little further on, Haro was also advising Delacroix on surface coatings um, to protect his paintings. And as we've seen in um, Ike's wonderful essay, uh, these illustrations of uh, Delacroix's studio, illustrations such, such as these are also an important source of information for conservators. For one thing, I, I just like seeing what room did an artist paint in, what was the source of light. And I was interested to see this huge window that emitted natural light. You get to see a little bit of the paint, the sizes of the canvases that are stretched, the stretchers, the easels. Um, some the paints, the paint materials in the foreground, these can be really important sources of information. Um, and then this is a picture of Delacroix's final studio, uh, which allowed him to be closer to the project in Sanso Peace. Again, um, very similar, huge window that emitted natural light. Of course, we can visit the studio today at the Musée Delacroix. And uh, as Ike illustrated in her essay, um, we have a painting of a, of a Delacroix exhibition um, by Albertini where we can judge uh, the color of his paintings as they looked to a contemporary. And we also have a photograph um, of an installation of his work. And these are also uh, rich sources for us. Um, but what I'd mostly like to talk about now are um, the artists that Delacroix was really looking at, really influenced by, obviously, um, the, Titian, the, the Venetian Renaissance painters, particularly Veronese, and also Rubens. As I was thinking about this talk, I kept thinking, so many of Delacroix's concerns as an artist are similar to my concerns. And I kept going back to the idea that here he was working in the 19th century, but he was so riveted by the works of the Renaissance and was looking so closely at these paintings and uh, at Rubens, just as we as conservators do, really trying to understand um, the artist's intention, the use of color, the brush strokes. Um, and I'm just showing you here one example of uh, Veronese's painting. Um, and obviously, as we've heard, he was very um, influenced by his hero, Rubens, um, and especially inspired by the Marie de Medici cycle, which he saw at the Louvre. He would comment on its eventual restoration, and he also um, famously copied one of the figures of the Nereids, which we see in the, um, in the exhibition, which I actually haven't seen yet, looking forward to. Um, and obviously, Delacroix was, um, he was rebelling against French academic practice, which it's prescribed instruction of painting after the nude or drawing after antique casts um, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, and, um, and rebelling against this type of a palette, this academic palette, uh, which was so carefully laid out um, with a range of mixed tones of 
to prepare for the ebosh of the flesh, as we can see on the left here, and these rows of color. Although, as we'll see in, in, um, in Delacroix's own palettes, he certainly was obsessive himself about palettes, um, but he, he made different ones. And again, just the kinds of slick, um, very finely modeled paint surfaces that uh, represented the work of this, uh, the academic tradition by Ang and David that he was rebelling against. Um, their emphasis on contours and, and slick surfaces is something that he was working very deliberately against. Um, I have to admit that up front that I'm going to be illustrating a lot of my comments today with paintings from the Kimball um, because I wasn't able to see the exhibition here um, and and this is what I had at hand and it was helpful for me and I hope hope it will be interesting for you um, to see some of these comparisons. We own this small sketch by Delacroix on the right, um, Salim and Zuleika from 1857 which we have not cleaned uh, but which when we acquired it in the, in the 80s, I think it had probably been recently cleaned. It, I think the colors retained a lot of their original vibrancy and I think perhaps this is an a, a interesting painting for us to look at today because as we've read in the catalog, um, so many of Delacroix's larger paintings have, have gone, gone through considerable alteration, mm -hmm. through sinking in color, through cracking, etc. And it's sometimes his small oil sketches that have really preserved the original vibrancy of his work. And I'm just comparing it to um, the, the painting by David on the left, just to show the contrast between um, really, I'm being a little unfair because I'm actually making the small sketch bigger than the David in some ways. Um, in reality, it's much smaller. But um, again, just I find it interesting to, to, to pair this kind of academic painting with, uh, with Delacroix's sketch to serve as a foil, what he was working against. Um, and when we see just the detail, the, um, the kind of loose brushwork, this kind of spontaneous application that, um, that, that Delacroix was using, you know, really rejecting contours and line, rejecting drawing, um, any kind of smooth modeling, and really, uh, making the use of impasto incredibly important as a carrier of light. I think it's interesting that, you know, he uses some of the same pigments that were so um, important to, say, the Venetian Renaissance painters like lapis lazuli, um, which is, you know, is a beautiful glazing color. And in, in the little sketch at the Kimball, you see him using it also as blobs of impasto. Um, and he was always, uh, you know, de Planet writes that that Delacroix was always encouraging them use more impasto. As for example, here we see in the head of Zuleika these these wonderful blobs um, blobs of impasto that um, he uses to to create the jewels in her in her headdress. Um, and I'm sorry for the reflection on the on the detail, but I thought this was the best way of kind of create um, showing you the surface texture of the painting. And we look at um, the modeling of the forms, again, contrasting it with the academic painting by David on the left. You see this kind of web of, uh, this kind of mesh of brush strokes um, that, you know, at a close, close range, they look perhaps a little bit clumsy, but at a little bit of a distance, they become fused. And this is such a characteristic of Delacroix's technique. Of course, um, he was one of the big uh, proponents of Chevreul's color theory, and Chevreul's ideas may have been introduced to Delacroix by Villon, his, his uh, colleague at the Louvre, his close friend who was instrumental in supervising all the restorations of paintings at the Louvre, which we'll hear about in a moment. And um, Delacroix very much based his use of color and even organized his own palette according to Chevreul's theories of simultaneous contrast. The idea that if you take two complementary colors and you put them side by side, that increases the intensity of each. And so um, I'm showing you the famous photograph of Delacroix's palette, which was so important to him as he wrote, my freshly arranged palette brilliant with contrasting colors is enough to fire my enthusiasm. 
he writes about his palette as if it's a musical instrument. He calls it his violin. And it, his, his passion for his palette goes beyond choosing the colors or uh, thinking about their arrangement. He coats his palette, sometimes with wax or sometimes with copal varnish. And as we'll see, he creates individual palettes for different projects. Um, this is one that he left to the artist Fantin Latour, and I think we're very lucky to have it, and I'm just contrasting it again with the academic palette. They look a little bit more similar than, than you might think, but then when you realize that he's one of the, the things that differentiates the two palettes is really the arrangement of the colors and their juxtaposition and how you know, he's really breaking with the academic tradition of having these gradated tones, and here he's mixing all these colors, um, as Chevreul would have him do. Um, and again, uh, I, th I was thinking about palettes earlier when we had the, dis the wonderful discussion about the, the, the mural paintings in uh, the Bibliothèque de Luxembourg, um, and this is maybe something to bear in mind that even when in some of the big uh, decorative projects where most of the work might have been done by Delacroix's students, my understanding is that he was always thinking about the palette beforehand, creating a palette and having the colors transferred to the edges of the painting. So this was, I think, in addition to, the, um, to supervising the design, he definitely was still controlling um, the use of color in these big decorative projects. And here's two examples. Um, and then I just thought it would be interesting because Rubens is so important to Delacroix and he learned so much from Rubens. Rubens' love of, love of color, the way uh, Rubens modeled forms so that they, um, things seem to project into space, his use of impasto, that we have these two oil sketches at the Kimball, one by Rubens, one by Delacroix, which are relatively the same uh, size and also I think both are in good condition. Though I have to say, when you think about Delacroix living more than 200 years after Rubens, and you think of him admiring Rubens' paintings in the Louvre, you have to ask yourself, what was he seeing? Was he really seeing Rubens' paintings the way they were painted, or was he appreciating his pa paintings through a veil of discolored varnish? Um, the painting on the left, when it was acquired by the Kimball, was covered with a really thick amber varnish that um, was actually removed by just chipping it away. And I'm only mentioning it. <laughs> I'm only mentioning that because I do think that the painting on the left is in remarkably good condition. So I think it's, it's interesting to compare these two paintings. Um, just in terms of what, so when, and I'm not suggesting obviously that Delacroix ever saw this particular sketch by Rubens, but obviously he was emulating Rubens' practice of making sketches, and I think that it serves as an interesting foil, perhaps, to think about Delacroix's technique in the painting um, on the right. So obviously, I think there's a real similarity in um, the, the kind of intertwining figures here, the kind of gestures that both of these artists are using. There's a totally different use of color, however, and I think on the right, in, the, in Delacroix, we see him putting Chevreul's color theories to work. Um, when he's contrasting the blue and the orange in um, Salim's costume, and, um, and also how very different the, the ha handling is, however much he might have been inspired by Rubens and Rubens' um, his own wonderful use of impasto. Um, this is no slavish imitation, in, in my view. Um, Again, th when you look at the impasto in the, in the flying figure in the Rubens, um, the little highlights in the hair and so on, it's, it's really quite different, um, a much more spontaneous application in the, um, in the Delacroix. And though there's a general similarity, I think, in the, in the importance of the color, um, I think there's a much, a much better sense of anatomy and um, and you know you get the sense that Rubens was much better draftsman than Delacroix um, because Delacroix's fluttering drapery it just doesn't have any of the kinds of um, modeling 
clear definition of shadows and highlights where you really get the sense of forms. It's, it's almost abstracted, just um, almost a flat field of color, wonderful intermeshed brushwork. And then when you look at um, the detail of the rocks and the waves um, hitting the rocks, they're somewhat actually cloud-like and formless, which is why I'm, I've kind of compared them to Rubens' clouds, because I thought they didn't look so very different, and yet um, they're lacking all the solidity that you might expect in rocks or waves. I mean, it looks very abstract. And we have a, another a second uh, Rubens' oil study at the Kimball, the Duke of Buckingham, um, which is, again, very similar in size to our Salim and Zuleika. Um, and again, just the, the much stronger sense of anatomy in Rubens, using an economy of brush strokes, you really feel the, the cheekbones, the sunken eyes, and I think in Delacroix's hands, um, it's much less clear. You see him perhaps imitating Rubens in um, a blue, adding a blue highlight to the cheek, but I just don't think you, you come, um, come away with as strong a sense of form or anatomy and say in the arm. But clearly, both have dazzling uh, use of color um, and interest in costume. And again, just to compare the head of Zuleika with the head of the Rubens. Um, you know, wonderful strands of hair, but there's n really not, very little that the modeling of, of this face has in common with uh, this um, with the wonderful technique of Rubens. And I sound like I'm criticizing Delacroix. Actually, I really um, appreciate both. Um, but I, I started picking up on this theme of technical flaws kind of in response to Ike's essay, and because that was what I was to, um, supposed to talk about today, this idea that um, this was a f maybe a flaw in the, in the minds of some of Delacroix's critics, that he was incapable of bringing a, a painting to an acceptable state of finish, and that he was incapable of creating this kind of illusionistic painting. Um, and certainly his, his anatomy was criticized. If we look at these, these hands, um, they're sort of, they look like they're, the fingers are kind of boneless. Or if you look at the figure of, um, of Zuleika, I'm, I'm recalling the earlier talk on the figure of liberty. And really, I don't get a very um, convincing feeling of um, her hips or her legs, really the anatomy that is um, behind, underneath those skirts. It's, um, it's a little bit awkward, um, and her little feet don't really seem capable of supporting this, this, <laughs> this figure. Um, yes, his, his brushwork was criticized as being in, as, as inarticulate and inacceptably sketch-like. And then when you think about his landscapes, I mean, they do have this beautiful chromatic subtlety as, as in our painting. Um, but he was incapable of, of really rendering convincing perspective and creating a uh, painting rocks in an illusionistic manner. I mean, I really don't get the feeling that, I don't feel the jagged edges of those rocks. And now at this point I have to pause and say, put on my conservator's cap, because at this point we have to say, well, is that the way he painted it or is that a question of condition? And maybe this is something that Eric and I can discuss further. Um, but I think in the case of this painting, I would consider this to be in actually very good condition. So I'm gonna blame that on his technique. Um, well, in this, this next section of my talk, I do want to talk about Delacroix's attitudes about restoration, both uh, works of other artists, such as Veronese and Rubens, and his own work. And again, this is how I identify with him very much, because he was going to the Louvre. He was passionate about these paintings that he was seeing there by Veronese um, and Rubens. And, you know, he was really criticizing the way many of them were being restored. Um, this is the famous print by Hogarth of time smoking a painting. We all know that paintings, once they leave the artist's easel, go through um, sometimes irreversible changes, pigment changes or um, varnishes yellow, and uh, that we always have to bear this in mind, and we certainly do with an artist like Delacroix. So he famously criticized um, the cleaning of the Veronese supper, uh, marriage at Cana, 
at the Louvre, a painting that was so inspiring to him in, in Veronese's use of color, especially in this figure at the bottom left with the contrast of the orange and the blue drapery. And um, he criticized his, his friend Fillon at the, at the Louvre. Whereas he would, um, when he went to Rouen and saw this painting by Veronese of St. Barnabas, he thought it was beautifully preserved. And he, um, he petitioned the director there, please do not touch this, um, this painting by Veronese. Um, you know, w when it comes to his own work, one of the big culprits um, in terms of preserving his paintings is the fact that he reworked them um, so much. And even his hero, Rubens, um, was guilty of this. Um, this is one example. There are others, um, Le Chapeau de Paille, where Rubens repainted, he added onto the panel here at the right, and he repainted part of the clouds. And this creates potential problems um, when a painting is being cleaned to distinguish the work of later restoration from an artist's own work. And sometimes these reworkings are, um, are very vulnerable to cleaning because they might appear on top of an oiling out layer or on another varnish layer. And it can be almost impossible to clean a painting without um, compromising some of these reworkings. And of course, one of the most famous um, examples of this would be in the work of Turner. And I'm showing you the Turner from the Kimball collection. Glaucus and Scylla, it's painted on panel, um, but it was conceived as a tondo, so you have to imagine that the corners actually would be framed out, and you would really just experience the composition as a tondo. And Turner, um, a contemporary of Delacroix, was famous for um, his unorthodox painting techniques. He mixed sand and wax into his oil paint. He continued to paint on top of varnish. Um, he, he would paint watercolor over oil. And these, these techniques make his paintings almost impossible to clean um, for, for the most part. And yet there's such a frustration in this because he was such a brilliant colorist, as, as was Delacroix. Um, and uh, the, Turner was famous for going to the Royal Academy on varnishing day and painting, continuing to paint over his um, varnished paintings um, in response to the paintings that were exhibited around his. So if he would see a constable to the left that had some bright red element, he might decide he needed a touch of red in his paintings. And again, this is well documented and, um, and it makes his paintings impossible. Well, um, unfortunately, Delacroix has a lot in common with this approach. I mean, now I'm going to go through a series of his paintings and talk about some of the condition problems that we've um, experienced in, in his work, starting with um, Dante and Virgil. So um, Delacroix's technique made his paintings extreme, make his paintings extremely difficult to treat. And this made him nervous about treatments. He talked about conservation treatments on a number of occasions and of his own work, and um, he, he blamed them for darkening certain areas in his paintings. I think this must have been very painful for him. Somebody as, in a way, visually sophisticated as Delacroix, such a student of old master paintings, monitoring what was going on at the Louvre, being critical of the cleaning of paintings by Rubens and Veronese, and yet in his lifetime, experiencing the restoration of his own paintings. This must have been very painful for him. But he, his paints were, especially in his early works, such as this one, his paints were rich in oil and he used cheap paints. He would use wax on his palette and he would endlessly retouch his own work as part of his painting process. And sometimes he would paint over um, a distemper which also caused a sinking in. Um, and this would cause his paintings, uh, his colors to lose their luster and gradually darken in tone. Um, we know that from Cezanne's 1864 copy of Dante and Virgil, which is much more brightly colored, that, that gives us some idea of how much this painting must have changed um, from the time that Delacroix painted it. But within about 37 years of this uh, being painted, 
major crack allure developed. And uh, the Louvre was getting ready to restore this painting. Delacroix did not want anyone at the Louvre to touch the painting. And um, he especially wanted to avoid any kind of clumsy retouching of this masterpiece. Quote, I consider it very important that my painting be retouched by myself. And when I speak of retouches, I have here in view only the repair of cracks, unfortunately too numerous, that have remained, that will have remained after restretching. Although his, his attitudes about cleaning moderated somewhat over time, Delacroix considered retouching to be truly evil. And um, his views are clearly set forth in his journal um, in something that he wrote in July of 1854. He wrote, quote, all bad restorations lead to the destruction of paintings. Um, he believed that retouching practiced by artist restorers were the absolute worst thing that could happen to a painting. So in February of 1860, he took it upon himself to retouch his um, Dante and Virgil himself, namely in painting the cracks that had um, following the relining at the Louvre. Um, this would have really been an exception to the usual practice at the Louvre. And he, in this instance, he sidestepped his friend, Villot, who was responsible for restoration at the Louvre, and went to his superior to, to plead his case. Um, he, so Delacroix tried to supervise restorations of his own paintings, including work on their support, their varnishing, and the treatment of degraded varnishes over his lifetime. Um, the massacre at Chios from 1824, when this painting was only 30 years old, it was already undergoing treatment at the Louvre. And this was about the time when Delacroix was writing scathing remarks about the cleaning of the Veronese in his journal. He was very dissatisfied about the work that was performed on his painting. He really had reservations about removing the varnish from um, the massacre at Chios. And he said, the shadows will lose transparency as a result, just as occurred in the Veronese. Um, the painting, The Death at, at Sardanapalus, this represents um, an example where his use of glazing and his varnishing practice resulted in the, the top layer of glazes becoming fused with the final varnish. And in areas where the varnish started to flake off, it was carrying away parts of his final surface with it. Not only the color, but actually the modeling that was in embedded in that final layer. Um, I mean, this is, th this is a problem that, you know, you, you, there, there's just nothing you can do about it. Um, the assassination of the Bishop of Liege. Delacroix um, discovered copal varnish when he traveled to England and um, met Bonington in about 1825, and Bonington was using copal varnish. Um, and a note in the restoration file of this painting um, stated that the varnish could not be thinned because it was both paint, the painting was both painted with copal and varnished with copal. Um, this is both what imparts such a magnificent luster to the painting, but makes it impossible to clean. So Degas' use of copal seemed to have two purposes, though. He was using it because he really liked the luster that it imparted, but it also provided a very hard surface, and he felt that it had a kind of a protective function. In fact, it, it really doesn't, because it's impossible to clean. Um, but he often referred to copal for its protective qualities, and he once wrote, everything should be varnished with copal. And as I mentioned earlier, he even coated the entirety of his palette with copal before using it. Um, Liberty leaving the people, Delacroix had covered the surface in several places with a pale yellow glaze, which was very difficult to distinguish from the old varnish. Yet this glaze performed a very important function in modeling um, the drapery folds of the dress, where it created the shadows of the folds. Um, so this painting also proved vulnerable to cleaning because some of the glazes, again, clung more to the varnish um, than to the paint surface itself. And the shipwreck of Don Juan from the um, Victorian Albert Museum. Delacroix admitted that um, adding finishing touches to a painting is very difficult, and you could, an artist could reach the point where reworking is no longer useful. And he said, 
quote, I'm, and I am a man prone to reworking. Well, his assistant, de Planet, um, wrote that Delacroix would return to his paintings very often to rework them after they'd been set aside and even varnished. And I think you can see in the detail here on the right, um, the conservators at the Victorian Albert noted um, when they examined the painting under the microscope that in fact there were success, um, that, there, that Delacroix had oiled out and varnished the painting and then returned to paint certain details, like adding these strokes of white uh, paint in the waves after the painting had dried after a long period of time, or um, in this detail of a red beret from the, um, one of the figures at the center that he had oiled out the red paint before adding a highlight and also added the finishing touches on the figures over layers of varnish and oil, again, making the, the painting impossible to clean. Um, and then the uh, basket of fruit in a garden from the Philadelphia Museum, again, is another example of the kinds of drying cracks that we often see in Delacroix's works because of this habit of reworking, especially the darks, and going back and using too much medium um, or working over paint layers that hadn't dried, and so these drying cracks would appear even in his lifetime. It, it's also a result of his rapid execution and spontaneous execution, which is one of the aspects of his work that we which we admire so much. The issue of varnish, uh, as I was thinking about this talk today, uh, um, really came to the surface as one of the most um, important aspects of Delacroix's technique, certainly for a conservator. Um, and it certainly represented an area of experimentation on his part. In February of, of, of 1849, he wrote in his journal, quote, I am experiencing with the painting Women of Algiers how agreeable and even necessary it is to paint on varnish. That shent, sent shivers down my spine. In 1845, he wrote about needing to protect a shipment of paintings from the rain because they had been varnished with egg whites, and, and if they had been rained upon, they would have been stained. So this, again, um, shows the kind of experiments he was doing with different uh, surface coatings, and I really do suspect that, um, again, his friend Etienne Harreau may have played a crucial role in this. Um, or later in 1852, he wrote that uh, Perignon had told him how to provisionally varnish a painting with gelatin that was sold by butchers, that you could dissolve it in water and it could be applied to the surface of a painting with a sponge. Um, and that same year he wrote that his friend Harrow had suggested that he dissolve wax and turpentine and um, with a little lavender added and apply that to his paintings to create a matte surface and that the matte coating rubbed with linen wouldn't have the drawbacks of other surface coatings. Um, I'm hoping that Eric will talk a little bit more about um, the Walters painting, Christ and the Sea of Galilee. I'm just showing two of the many versions of this um, subject. But especially during the last years of Delacroix's life, he really distrusted varnish removal which he considered, rightly so, dangerous for his work. Um, and he, he expressed concern for one of the versions of Christ on the Sea of Galilee. If it proves necessary to remove the varnish before it is retouched, in my eyes, it will be a dishonored painting. And two years before his death, he described one of the paintings of Christ on the Sea of Galilee that, had, uh, re, that was retouched as being, quote, dishonored. He, he believed that cleaning um, in the form of removing varnish was the most extreme intervention. I think he was right about that. He said he would far prefer to have a hole in a painting than have it be cleaned. He knew that varnish was problematic, but yet he kept on using it. Um, and he had to come, he, he came to accept that there would be sometimes periodic cleaning and revarnishing of his paintings as a fact of life. Um, but in spite of his general attitude, he was reluctant to give up these unorthodox techniques that rendered his painting so vulnerable to cleaning. But he believed that only a painting that had never, he believed that only a painting that had never been varnished could retain its original characteristics over time. Yet he, he kept on varnishing his paintings. Uh, here I'm just showing you a comparison again of our painting with the view of Tangier from the seashore 
just by way of saying that I think the, some of the better preserved oil sketches um, can provide a valuable touchstone in assessing um, works from the period and how they may have changed as a result of, of Delacroix's unorthodox techniques or as a result of, of um, restoration. And again, in some of the decorative projects, particularly um, in the murals at San Sulpice, where he's now using wax as part of the medium, and that uh, brings, carries with it its own uh, problems in terms of cleaning, in, in being a very, uh, a, a paint surface that is very sensitive to any kind of cleaning intervention that would employ the use of solvents. Um, we've talked a little bit about how his contemporary Turner, um, his techniques in some ways I think really mirrored um, Delacroix in his unorthodox approach to varnishing and retouching and continuing to paint. Um, I, I wanted to just show one example of a work of Bonington from the Kimball, um, Delacroix's friend with whom he shared a studio briefly. Um, as I think this is maybe an example of how Bonington was perhaps approaching painting in a somewhat similar way to uh, Delacroix, this idea of not so much relying on drawing, but really modeling um, from the middle of the form. Um, this is an infrared reflectogram mosaic of our painting, which shows a little bit of sketching. But I thought that the X-radiograph was very telling in terms of how Bonington was capturing um, these buildings on site of the Grand Canal. Um, I think it almost looks like a Hans Hoffmann here. He's so boldly applying these um, brush strokes to lay in the masses of the building. And I couldn't help but think a little bit about Delacroix modeling from the center of his figures and not worrying so much about contours. And then I think it's in the final stage of painting that Bonington comes back and really carefully with you know a dilute uh, brown paint very carefully renders the architectural details, giving the, the, the impression of drawing, but actually it's all carried out through painting, or how he uses a single brush stroke to really define the edge of that bridge. Maybe you can see it a little bit better here. And just the, again, that touch is the bearer of meaning, how the impasto itself is really creating that edge. It's not a drawn line in the conventional sense. Um, well, I'm going to end my talk with some of the Impressionist paintings at the Kimball and, and I, to suggest that artists like Cezanne and Gauguin were among the many uh, later 19th century artists who were so influenced by Delacroix's use of color, who also um, promulgated, you know, the Chevrolet's theory and their own approach to color. But unlike Delacroix, they really... Um, they really separated themselves from using varnish. Um, Gauguin famously would sometimes coat his paintings with a thin layer of wax, but that's as, about as far as it went. And when we cleaned our Gauguin on the right, it had been later coated by varnish that was yellow. We found underneath that layer of yellow varnish a very thin coating of wax, and which gives it a kind of a matte, satiny surface. Um, Cezanne didn't varnish his paintings. And so I think, you know, when we talk about if I can get from point A to point B, what is the remedy? Um, I think the remedy for, the, for some of the artists who followed Delacroix was to keep the color but lose the varnish, um, which is something that he never did. Um, and just some details of, again, I can't look at this face now without thinking about Delacroix and the juxtaposing the orange and the blue, this simultaneous uh, contrast of color that was so important to Delacroix and others. Um, and just the surface itself, it's kind of messy uh, web of brush strokes um, that makes me think of Delacroix even though it doesn't look exactly like Delacroix or the hand which is so in a way weak in terms of its anatomy. This wasn't the point. Um, or someone like Monet with his uh, swirling brushwork and his, um, and his brilliant use of contrasting blue and yellow in one of the Weeping Willow paintings. Um, and I'm just gonna end with this comparison of palettes. Um, one of Delacroix's palettes for the paintings in Sansal Peace 
um, compared with the detail from the Gauguin showing his palette and the Pizarro and suggesting that it, it just, um, we see how far we've come in terms of thinking about color um, where uh, it's really become all about, you know, we've lost the kind of systematic organization of the academic palette and really it's all about vibrant color and unvarnished paintings in which the color can be preserved. So I guess to get back to the point of what is the remedy for Delacroix, I think the remedy is to understand and to appreciate and to respect his paintings and to preserve them as he tried to do with uh, the work of Veronese and Rubens. And I think having a symposium like the one we're having today in an exhibition like the one in Santa Barbara is, is a good way of advancing that goal. Thank you very much. Hi, well, I'm Eric Gordon. I'm um, head of painting conservation at the Walters Art Museum. <clears throat> and I just want to uh, start by um, breaking with tradition, uh, today's tradition, and um, first um, saying how displeased I am with your talk because, <laughs> <laughs> because I have nothing to talk about tomorrow. <laughs> and in a certain sense, I suppose that's, that's the greatest compliment, you know, in that. Um, We've, we've both found very similar um, issues dealing with these, these paintings, and actually some of the same quotes. <laughs> um, I think that um, there are some really interesting issues that have come up. Um, and of course, this is the first time I've heard this uh, talk, so um, excuse me if I'm a little hesitant in um, what I'm saying here today. I, I think that one thing that um, is important to keep in mind is all the changes that were going on um, in terms of artist materials in the 19th century, and in the, especially in the early 19th century. Um, you know, artists started now really being able to buy paint in tubes and different kinds of paints, and there was not, you know, kind of a regulate, regulatory system where you would have the same kind of oil added to the same kind of pigment. Um, there was a great deal of variety, diversity in materials, and people were experimenting, and I think that um, what you see with um, Delacroix's paintings and techniques is a perfect example for better and for worse of, of what can happen in those instances. And I think that one thing that's very interesting um, that you were bringing up um, was this, this discoloration, which you might see. And I think it's possible that um, with a sketch, for instance, that you showed at the, um, the Kimball, which is so colorful and basically lighter in palette. I mean, I'm wondering how that compares to a painting that has more darks in it. Um, you know, like the, the painting, the kiosk, or, or some of these other pictures, where the darks suffer more than the lights. And so there is this, this greater um, disparity between um, understanding what, what Delacroix was, was aiming for. And I know that, um, <clears throat> for instance, if you look at some of his palettes, um, when you look at, let's say there are maybe half of the, the palette might be dark pigments and half might be brighter pigments. Uh, the darks, the dark pigments, very often, it could even be like a, a green or a blue, a dark blue or a dark green, they look black when you just see the palette. And I think that that's, that's something to think about when you're looking at some of these pictures, how they've changed with time. Um, let's see, what else did I want to mention? Um, and and I, I really thought that that was a very good point that you made regarding you know, some of the, the draftsmanship. And if perhaps because of his techniques, some of these pictures have been overcleaned. Um, I think that um, he, he isn't necessarily the draftsman uh, that Rubens might be. I, I don't get the sense that that was 
as important to him um, as the form and color and projection, which you've noted. Um, but I think that there are instances, as, as you've mentioned, in terms of um, his use of new materials where the paintings are overcleaned. And so you don't see what he put down on his, uh, on his pictures. Um, and also, I, I thought it was very interesting, your comparison to Turner and the idea of reworking um, we have a, a very large, uh, very nice Turner in our collection. And similar to what you were saying uh, with Varnishing Day, um, this Turner that we have um, was criticized when it was exhibited. And so <clears throat> Turner went back and literally just started painting out uh, features in the picture. And because of his technique, there was this terrible um, cleavage between the layers of uh, Turner 1, Turner 2, <laughs> and Restoration, which was put on later than that. And this was a picture um, that, it's a painting that's been requested many times, and for many years we just could not lend this painting out because it was discolored, you know, so it didn't look so good. But also it had this cleavage, you know, you had, you know, paint that was raised, and we weren't sure whose paint it was, you know? Um, and we did a careful study. I mean, it, we treated this painting. It took a couple of years to treat this picture. And we were very conservative with it. And, you know, we, whenever we thought that it might be um, Turner reworking, you know, obviously we didn't, didn't remove it. But it's interesting how um, not only did he, did Delacroix retouch his picture, rework his pictures, but there's also, um, the, the restoration, he did restorations of his own pictures. So that's kind of an ethical question right there. What does one do? Um, because probably his restorations have discolored. You know, let's say you go back to uh, Dante and Virgil and what he might have done 30 years after, the original painting might not even match, um, you know, because paint's discolor. Um, so anyway, those are just some thoughts that have come to uh, my head hearing. Well, and, you know, maybe we should state up front, too, that as conservators and we belong to a professional organization with a code of ethics, um, you know, our professional organization believes that artists should not be the restorers of their own work. So that kind of flies in the face of, you know, modern thinking right. that a conservator, a trained conservator can be truly respectful and limit and not invent and just limit their retouching to areas of damage and do it in such a way that it's reversible and documented and so on. So, you know, you raise a good point. Any retouching that he might have done to Dante and Virgil to those drying cracks itself would discolor. And then what do you do with discolored Delacroix retouching? Right, right, right. So <coughs> it does raise a lot of ethical questions. Here. Um, and I really enjoyed seeing all of those details. Um, they were magnificent. So thank you. I want to ask you something basic about uh, differences in Delacroix's paint application. And I think Margaret, w who calls herself a kiosk junkie, I know what, um, what she means. And I'm really interested in the difference between when we get a sense that Delacroix has created a way to deal with paint as something matte versus when it's uh, gleaming and viscous and liquid and fast. Because I think that one of the things I like about Kios is that some, and I don't know if he was letting it dry longer, and I, I think it's differently painted in different parts of portions of the canvas. But one of the things that I like about it is the sense that he had let it dry perhaps long enough that uh, he was able to treat all sorts of areas with almost, um, you know, if you look at the, the foreground and the cracks and even the marks on the older um, woman's, the red and green marks, there's just a sense of a certain um, material a resistance that the matte surface provides him that when he gets really working later as a kind of slick, fast painter of a more um, uh, oily technique, 
um, it starts to get really glossy. And I don't think it's just about varnishing later, but is there something fundamental that happens between sort of early Delacroix's, um, sometimes even Chardonnay-esque um, kind of bubbling, coagulated, but also somewhat dry surface and those uh, kind of quick imagistic sort of scenes you've been showing us. Do you have anything to say about matteness versus slickness and and um, I think it's a really good question and it's a question that um, I think from 19th century onward it's a question that conservators wrestle with. Uh -huh. You know if something has been varnished, if something is supposed to be matte, if something is not supposed to be matte. In my sense, and you know please jump in, my sense is that unless one were able to literally compare Delacroix's writing about mm -hmm. a specific piece mm -hmm. saying this I'm I'm aiming for a velvety surface or I'm <sighs> aiming for a rich, glossy, thick surface. I really have no idea how you would be able to I mean I think it's kind of be you know, there'd be, you'd have hubris to, mm -hmm. to be able to say, I know what he wanted. I think right. you'd have to be able to, um, just to check. I agree totally with what Eric just said, and just my um, first reaction is to be a little bit suspicious that that was totally intentional, mm -hmm. given how unorthodox he was in his um, technique and how problematic his darks have been for him. So I would definitely be a little bit suspicious and would want to go see if he wrote about it, um, if that was intentional or not. If it was intentional, that really becomes very interesting because that seems to set up an idea that it's pursued later by other artists, even the Cubists. But that, but that kind of matte, glossy um, variation that you're responding to, I'm not sure. I, I just don't so know in Kios that I can't yeah. imagine you can make the case that it's just accidental. It's just, mm -hmm. um, and it's so different than liberty. I mean, one of the things that makes later Delacroix difficult for me is the ways in which it becomes more and more oily, transparent, fluid, and of course at its best that's gorgeous, but often I just want a little material resistance that seems to be both about the ground that he's using and some way that he's applying paint that's a bit different in that early work. Well, compared to Sardanopolis, sure. for God's sake. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. No. Yeah. So I'm Todd. I'm a self-confessed um, kiosk junkie as well. Um, <laughs> I, was, I, was, I'm gonna, I have another. But one of the things about that particular painting, it seems, is there's the, with the in 18th century French, we call the reflet, which is that you know there's this wonderful, luscious passages between objects, which are reciprocal um, matching of hue mm -hmm. that again it, it the, reds. the reds the reds the reds and the in the reds in where the shadow should be and it, it seems like in that painting has a different strategy in terms of the uh, adjacent color relations than mm -hmm. later I don't know if you right that. Um, well, that's the comment. The other comment was I, I was thinking about your um, this, this whole notion of experimentation and how it relates to uh, Mark's talk about. Um, I was thinking about um, the Nizukari, um, Tadio Zucchero, and um, this the traditions of 18th, uh, 17th, 16th, 17th century uh, master pupil relations, which uh, so what. What you did is, if you're a pupil, you ground pigments in the studio. That was, that was the grunt work, and you elevate it. So, and thinking of Lecoq, um, Lecoq is like to, this wiping that away. And it seems to me that there's an interesting relationship between Delacroix and this destruction of the, um, that those those kinds of intimate workshop relations, which is a grinding of pigment. You have an, you know, you have a, a guy on the outside bringing the stuff in, so it, it, it kind of changes the workshop relations between master and pupil. I think that's a good point, and also, um, I mean, and also to pick back up on Eric's point of, you know, artist color men were providing paints and tubes and all of that was changing, and then you also get the idea of um, Delacroix leaving the kind of workshop and getting advice from friends on the outside, 
try mixing wax with turpentine and add a little lavender. Try that, you know, or you go get some gelatin from the butcher. Try that. And so it's, it's breaking down that kind <coughs> of tradition. I mean, really, another example of, of working against the academy and, you know, breaking down all of those traditions, those received so traditions. A very specific question along with, which is you compare the two different palettes, the academic yes. palette and Delacroix's palette. And it seemed like, uh, and the, the palette for the academic palette was about flesh, right? So presumably it's about, um, and I'm thinking of David's, the, the David you're showing you, our David's Otheratii and his, the legs of the, which is a kind of translucent layered ground with blue underneath, and it was really amazing depth and stratification of layers. Right. Um, and I'm, so, and then that, help me out here, is the, is the kind of comparison of the palette about a certain kind of stratification and then final use of varnish that's being in a some sense disavowed by Delacroix, is it, is he avoiding translucent um, uh, stratification. Well, or yeah, a is, jump is in, he, Eric. Is he concerned with that? Is he still, or is he just juxtaposing? I think he's doing away service. with the prescribed stages as laid out in the academy, you know, of the. Right. He, he's, um, he's taking a lot of shortcuts there, and he's letting, I think, the color juxtapositions do a lot of the work. Um, and he's creating new stages of retouching over varnish. I mean, that would be one way I would respond. But Eric, yeah, one thing in. that I find kind of curious, I don't know if this has anything to do with what you're saying, but something that's come to me over the day and in doing my research is, um, I think if, if one were to just look at a Delacroix without bringing all of this uh, knowledge or baggage or whatever we want to call it uh, to the picture, you know, one might think, what is this guy like? You know, he's got like brushwork all over the place and it's really wild and crazy. And then you look at his palette mm -hmm. and then you look at his studio and then you look at photographs of him <clears throat> and you hear what people wrote about him. And he, I don't know, obviously, as much as you scholars know about him, but he sounds in a certain sense like a very neat, tidy person. And that's how the, the little I've read mention it, but you look at his pictures and they don't look neat and tidy at all. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of, you know, he, in a certain sense I think he, he must have in his head a, a real structure. And so in terms of glazing and in terms of paint application, he's knowing what he's doing. And so I think that um, it's not quite as crazy uh, as one might think just by looking at his pictures. and. You know, with kind of this idea, you might think he would be more of an academic type picture, painter, you know, with all of this order. And as I said, you know, you see these palettes and you think, you know, and he's he like was, obsessive and compulsive. Yes, he was known <laughs> to be, you know, meticulous about his materials and to really worry right. about his craft. And it's, it's sort of, as they say in Texas, bless your heart, because as obsessive as he was about his craft, that wasn't enough to make his paintings, um, you know, withstand his and sometimes unorthodox layering. Um, yeah, I mean, he was—he really jumped on the bandwagon of anything new that came out, and so he, as, as Claire was saying, with um, recipes from friends and all of this, and he would just try it. And actually, one thing that I wanted to bring out—I um, was thinking of talking about tomorrow when we're all together is, you know, there's a quote that Mark used that I was planning, I'm planning on using it tomorrow too, <laughs> and that he talks about moderns, and mm -hmm. it was from a journal entry in 1857, and um, he says their pictures are going to self I can't remember exactly what it is, but, you know, these pictures are not going to last. And, you know, my question is, so is he talking about himself? You know, who's he talking about, you know? Um, because that's just what he's doing, you know. He's using these materials that self-destruct, you know. It's, it's what we call inherent vice in, uh, in conservation because they just destroy themselves, you know, so. Um, I had a very specific question for Claire, and maybe I'm just misremembering, but um, are, are we absolutely sure that the Bride of Abydos 
is a sketch? Um, I, you know, I guess I don't know. I've assumed, I've assumed that it is from the size, but. Um, I'm trying to re remember from the catalog raisonné mm -hmm. because there are multiple versions of right. this composition, one of which is in Lyon, I think, and I couldn't borrow because of issues of condition. I think it's on panel. Uh, but it also is diminutive in mm -hmm. size. And you know, this is one of the issues that I think recurs in our exhibition as well, is trying you know, long after the fact to determine whether or not something is a preparatory sketch actually functioning as a means of getting to a more realized, finished version, or if it's actually just a very sketchy execution of a finished object. And the painting is it's signed and dated, um, you know, so you, ra you raise a good point. Yeah, I wondered whether, you know, because at that point he's painting so loosely that it's very easy at this point in time to mistake, just like the Nelson Atkins picture, which I think is a fascinating um, example, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, because I think that had been actually classified as a sketch, and now we think of it as a, a finished painting. It's just very loosely handled. Does anybody else have anything? Back first. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, can either of you um, elaborate on uh, the color or the the surface that exists today on uh, of the painting Liberty as opposed to uh, say the surface that existed when Cezanne saw it, and in, in, uh. in terms of me seeing it. To, Two years, you know, two years ago, it was just a shambles, and I went, oh my God. You know, I mean, uh, anyway, if you guys have any information. Claire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I haven't seen Liberty uh, with my own eyes recently, I really hesitate to answer that, how, how it specifically has changed. Um, I just know from, you know, the research I did for this talk, that it probably has changed through, you know, having a, gl a glaze, a final glaze that was compromised that helped in the shadowing, uh, the shadows of some of the drapery folds. Um, but it may have changed in other ways too, and I, I'm sorry that I can't really comment more specifically on that, not having seen the painting. I don't know if it's still in, in Lens, but, um, or if it's back at the Louvre, but it was not there the last time I was in Paris, so um, I don't know I if you nothing to can add. add to that. But it's a good question, and I certainly will be looking. Um, could you please tell me what, what it was that Delacroix objected to in the restoration of the Veronese? And whether you, I assume it's some kind of distortion that he was afraid of, yes. whether you as a, a conservator agree with him that those measures that were taken at the time were um, a, a distortion. And I'm asking that sort of um, with the idea or the knowledge that um, of the reactions that we had when the Sistine uh, ceiling uh, right. frescoes were changed so radically and, and people just did not want to accept that because it when uh, you know, the way they look now flies in the face of all that we always knew about old, old master and Renaissance painting. And I was wondering if maybe Delacroix's own expectations of a Veronese were just based on what he knew and not what they really right. were. I, you know, I wish, as I understand it, what he was responding to specifically with the cleaning, what he really commented on with the cleaning of the Veronese was that the, de the shadows had lost their transparency, that he seemed to be really disturbed by that. It's, it's impossible to, for me to judge, you know, whether that would have been a good, respectable cleaning or not. Um, I tend to think, and Eric, maybe you, you can comment on this too, that the, the Veronese was probably a little bit more, um, would have probably held up rather well to cleaning um, I, at that time. Um, and so I, I wondered if, if Delacroix wasn't overreacting a little bit. I mean, he seemed to understand what a, a yellow varnish did to a painting, that a yellow varnish 
makes the darks look lighter and it makes the lights look darker and it kind of reduces things to a monotone. But he, he, he seemed to really be focusing on how the, dark, how the shadows had changed and lost transparency. And right, I mean, your, your comment about the Sistine ceiling is well taken. Um, you know, I think that was a very respectful cleaning, not a dangerous one. Um, and the only, I think there too, there was an issue of reworking by Michelangelo that had to be understood. But I think that the, the conservators did understand where he had come back and made some changes using Secco and were very respectful of that. And other, other than that, I think what they were using to remove dirt and grime was basically very safe. I mean, fresco is a very durable kind of painting. So I think that was a very, really amazing cleaning. Um, and, you know, it's a very difficult subject to talk about cleaning and cleaning controversies. Uh, because sometimes cleanings are criticized when they were really well done. And the person doing the criticizing doesn't understand the artist or the technique. But in other cases, they're right that paintings are overcleaned. I can't really judge whether Delacroix was right or not. Yeah, what, I just, what do you think? I just wanted to, to make two points, kind of to bring it back to kind of 19th century thoughts. Um, and philosophies, and one is um, how the looking at pictures and the appreciation of, of materials and techniques and paintings does change and is subjective, and in the 19th century there was kind of this old master type of, of, of look that was often appreciated, and, you know, kind of a yellower um, surface. And of course, um, all the varnishes were natural resin varnishes um, back then, and so they <clears throat> basically started out kind of yellow. Um, so that's, that was just one thing I wanted to mention. The other thing is that um, I, I always find it kind of curious to remember how um, with Turner, <clears throat> you know, who's a contemporary, <clears throat> excuse me, um, there are many frames, Turner frames, that you can see like in the V&A and the Tate which are original frames to uh, his pictures. And they originally had room for glass. And so there was originally glass over a lot of these pictures. And um, I don't think it was just for security purposes, <laughs> although that, that's, uh, that is uh, a, a, a reason for glass. But I think it also is to protect the surface from yellowing and from dirt and all of those kinds of things. So, you know, just those, those two kind of issues are, are interesting to remember how subjective um, one's appreciation can be and can, and can be so um, influenced by what is going on at the time, how people are thinking about um, the look of a picture at the time, such as the old master look, and also um, the materials and uh, what an artist might choose to, uh, to do to protect his picture, such as have a frame made that has glass that comes in front of the painting. Anybody else? Um, in which case, let's see, where are we? What time is it? If I had hoped that we would have sort of a a more general discussion. It's already five o'clock, however, so I, I don't know if we want to keep on going or if we should just now bring this to a close. It's been a fantastic day. Um, if there is a burning question that somebody wants to ask of any of our speakers today, um, we're open to a, one more question. I just had a question about, um... Yeah, I missed the the morning session, and I noticed you're filming. I was wondering if you're going to put that, what, what you're going to do with that. Uh, presuming all of our speakers are um, OK with it, we will post the videos of the lectures on our website. So um, I don't know how long that'll take, but eventually they'll get up there. Um, I guess the one question that I still have in my own mind, which has been really a bear to deal with in dealing with the catalog, but also just in general, is how ethical it is to Photoshop Delacroix's paintings to make them approximate what I guess we all think they should have looked like when they were done. And um, I noticed in everybody's talk that 
almost every single image was irradiated <laughs> so that the massacre at Kios is suddenly luminously yellow. Um, and I, I just wonder in general, in terms of our field, what we, what we do with that whole problem. And I'm completely guilty of photoshopping the catalog because we had to, it, we couldn't sell the book unless we had modified the images, which we can do so easily. So anyway, that's just a question I throw out there. Um, well, I, I, there is the, the philosophy, the thought that there's this golden glow, and that's a, kind of a very 19th century. Uh, I, I don't know specifically in terms of Delacroix if that was something that he believed in, but it is, um, you do read about it a lot and hear about it a lot in 19th century pictures. Maybe you'll have the last word. Okay. Inherent vice. Uh, <laughs> I love that because, I, I, in other words, there's this question about um, even when the old master technique, that there's a built in um, anticipation of modification through time uh, rather than thinking that that moment in the studio is the moment. Um, because I like uh, one of the things I've been perplexed by in terms of studying Roman uh, painting of the 16th century is how many important artists do outside fresco work. You know, in other words, that's, it's like the unstudied area. Nobody wants to talk about it, but like everywhere, you know, there, there was a really important artist, Caravaggio de Pomodoro. Um, in other words, artists who, you know, would immediately anticipate the conditions of the, de not degeneration, but modification of the work through time. So that's a, that's, that adds to this issue about, again, uh, you know, Delacroix is on the extreme end, but this this notion of anticipating discoloration, et cetera, as part of workshop practice, I think. Um, I think we're going to have to uh, bring this to a, an end, but I, I want to thank all of our speakers. I mean, it was a great day. Thank you so much for coming.